Today on Blue 58, injuries have defined the Packers season in a few different ways, but if you don't happen to have inside knowledge of the human body, it can sometimes be hard to know exactly what those injuries mean. We'll try to clear that up with some help from a returning guest today. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink, and I am happy to be with you here for another episode. It's been kind of a weird injury year for the Packers. They have had some notable injuries, as they do every season. But other than David Bakhtiari, nobody major has been lost for the year, with apologies to Tyler Davis. At least not so far. That could always change, as happens very frequently with injuries. But injuries have affected this team in numerous ways, and some of the Packers' aches and pains have been a little bit confusing. How did David Bakhtiari's nearly three-year-old knee injury get to this point? What injury did Eric Stokes deal with anyway, and why has it kept him out so long? And why do the Packers seem to have so many hamstring problems? Athletic trainer Luke Lyons returns to the show today to help us figure those things out. So the first thing I wanted to ask you about is, I guess, someone who's winning the award for the biggest Packers injury story of the year for four years in a row now, David Bakhtiari. We got a little bit more information, well, I guess a lot more information about what was going on with him. But the specific thing that stuck out to me was a term that I hadn't heard before when he's talking about his knee injury, femoral condyles. Apparently he's having issues with those. What are those? How do those factor into ACL recovery? So if you think of the knee joint as a hinge, just a typical door hinge, open the 180 and back down, um, your condyles are going to be the equivalent of a washer inside of that joint to keep those two, uh, if you will, balls on the top of your femur from rubbing when that joint opens and closes. It acts a Similar to a meniscus, it's actually one of the underlayers of a meniscus tear. Um, it's very, very common with an ACL, uh, any sort of, mainly with ACL, but a lot of the other injuries that happen within that knee, the amount of force that pulls, if it removes it from the bone or the middle, um, the amount of force involved in that tear is very, very common to see a either condyle or a meniscus uh, injury in and of itself. It, Sounds from what I've heard and from what I've seen um, is that that's what happened with uh, Bakhtiari. He ended up tearing that ACL, and when he did, the docs, when they went in to repair it, only removed a limited amount of that meniscus, um, which then caused a lot of the swelling, a lot of the fluid, because that meniscus was still, if you will, loose and flapping around. So you have a hinge and a pair of washers inside of that hinge and one of those washers broke, and they went in and removed about a third of it. Well, you still got two-thirds of a broken washer sitting in that joint, so every time that thing opens and closes, it rubs, the inflammation is still there, your body's trying to heal it, so it's still pushing fluid and blood cells into that spot, Um, so the discomfort level of that knee is going to be a lot more than we were led to believe with a typical surgery. The typical surgery term there is is interesting because you you said that this is not an uncommon issue, at least the way Bakhtiari himself talked about it and some reporters who have done a little bit of work on this talked about it. It made it sound like the, the condyle issue was pretty uncommon, that this isn't something you see a lot with an ACL injury. Obviously, you don't have the specifics. You haven't seen scans or, or worked with David on something like this. Uh, but but is it is it as common or or is it an uncommon thing to see this kind of issue pop up? It's common to see uh, meniscus and condyle tears. It's uncommon for it to be affecting his mobility and his movements to this degree. It's a pretty common thing that you'll see pop up with a uh, ACL. You'll see that meniscus and the condyle injuries. Um, typically, a doc will go in and be able to clean it up, pull as much as they think is necessary out of it, the body will reheal it, um, and you're good to go within, I mean, nine months is typical ACL stuff. To the level and degree that Bakhtiari has had it, that is what is so uncommon with it. It's not so much the doctor or the surgeon went in there and was like, oh, I'm only going to cut out this much and then messed up. It's He did 
prescribed what is typical for an average ACL surgery, cleaning up somewhere around 10 to 15% of a meniscus, checking that condyle. It sounds like David's knee in and of itself is causing him so much discomfort. It's not healing correctly. The blood flow is still too much to it. So it's less of the fact that this injury itself is uncommon and more to do with his ability to heal from this injury is what's odd and unique. We're at what is supposed to be the end here. Bakhtiari talking about how this should be it. This should fix the issue. Whether it does or it doesn't, it seems like we're at the end of his story, at least this part of it. Looking back on on what we've all seen, what we've you know gone through as Packers fans, the information that we've gotten, does it kind of boil down to this really seeming like a, a really rare injury? I would say that would be something that, especially with the amount of injuries we're seeing increase throughout the NFL through the last even 10 years, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in substantial season-ending type injuries, whereas years before, you know, even going back to early as, you know, 2010, 2011 in there, it's gone up by a significant amount. Uh, I believe that right now there's a 4% chance at any given game that any given player is going to be injured. So the likelihood of meniscus, condyle, ACL tears in and of itself is going to increase. Um, as far as do we have to worry about every ACL tear that comes through, we got to now check on the meniscus and the condyle. That's typical with ACL things. It's the uniqueness that it's taking him this long to heal from it is what's concerning. You know, if Zach Tom goes out and blows his ACL, don't want to speak that into existence, knock on all the wood. Um, you, I wouldn't be concerned with checking in on his meniscus. That's not a a severity issue that's common with that sort of injury. Bakhtiari's story is a little bit more on the negative side. We've dealt with it for a long time. There is some positive injury news in Green Bay, if there is such a thing. Uh, Eric Stokes appears to be making his way back from what was what sounds like a pretty complicated injury. It turns out to have been a two-parter, both the foot and the knee. Let's start with the foot. What is a Liz Frank or Liz Frank injury? How does that affect you as an athlete? So Liz Frank is can be a whole lot of things. The Liz Frank uh, specific complex is across that metatarsal, so the arch of your foot. Um, there's, I believe, somewhere up between around eight uh, bones, major bones that create the arch of your foot. Um, and a Liz Frank is an injury in that joint. So they kind of group all of those joints of those eight different bones, depending on how you classify the heel, um, up into the, the metatarsal bones of your foot. But every single one of those bones, those little cube bones inside the arch of your foot, they all rub. Those are all joints. They're very limited movement. Obviously, it's not like your arch is folding around but they do have some degree of movement. So any injury within that couple square inches across the top of your foot is considered a Liz Frank. Now, it can be something as minor as a strike, slight strain of a tendon in there, that's a Liz Frank injury. It can be something as severe as a full-on break, fracture, ligament strain, that's still a Liz Frank injury. From the sounds of it, especially with the amount of pressure and um, explosiveness that somebody like Sp Stokes has, that's going to make that injury worse. You know, if it's your average weekend warrior out playing around, it's probably a grade one strain. It's a NFL corner who runs a 4-4, four, 4-3. Four, four, that is going to be a more significant injury. Typically, a Liz Frank is going to be something that takes a while to come back from. That's not a, not something that's going to be a weekend course. So as far as his dual injury goes, 
from the sounds of it and from what I've been reading and from my understanding, the Liz Frank is what's caused the majority of it. And he actually had to go so far as to get pins into that foot, which leads me to believe that there was a full break in a couple of those cube bones inside his actual arch of his foot. So think about the trauma, the swelling, every time that foot flexes, every time that arch has pressure of a body movement on it, it's going to cause pain. And now you put that into the perspective of a guy whose entire career is built around his speed and his athleticism. You know, he's not a finesse player. He's a bigger, stronger, faster player. That is just going to make that injury so much harder to come back from to get back to that 100% that we're expecting. It sounds like an injury that no matter what severity you have of it, with all these different moving parts in your foot and your ankle, the arch of your foot, it's just going to be a time recovery as much as a surgical recovery. Coupling in the surgery in there, how does that complicate your recovery from an injury like this? It's, the surgery time is fairly limited on this one. Um, again, depending on the severity, without knowing that, it can be something as simple as an outpatient to something that needs a couple days of actual care within it, depending on the where they were, what bones broke, what pins are in, what ligaments are torn, things like that. The ma majority of the injury is that recovery time. It is the physical therapy. It is the off-the-field work. That is the gross majority of a year to get back to that full mobility that we're anticipating. Every push off of that foot, every weight bearing of that foot, every single movement is going to put painful pressure onto that joint. It's kind of like a shoulder injury where you can't, or a collarbone, where you, it takes forever to heal because you can't really immobile it short of, you know, rest and crutches, there's no real way to keep that joint from moving and be mobile. So that's why that's been a lot of time is needed to create, to allow them to get back on the field. The last major area of concern, I guess, as far as injuries go in the Packers is hamstrings. It seems like there have been a, a proliferation of hamstring injuries, or maybe it's just two high-profile players that have had them. But both Christian Watson and Aaron Jones have dealt with hamstring injuries um, at times this year and are, are still dealing with it in, in Aaron Jones' case. The question I always see among Packers fans, especially some some loud ones on social media, um, <laughs> is, is why can't they prevent things like this? That seems like a simple question. I suspect that it probably isn't. So from an athletic training perspective, hamstring injuries, your thoughts? So hamstrings actually produce around 20 to 25% of all injuries in professional sports. It's your hamstring. Um, putting that up against other injuries such as like concussions or um, shoulders or ribs or anything, it is one of the top three most common injuries to have. Now, like I said before, that's been going up the last 10, 15 years. Those injuries have been increasing. Um, a lot of that trends from the fact that we are wearing cleats out on the field whose foundation was built in you know, the early 30s. And reality, the structure of cleats have not entirely changed all that much. It's arrangement of pegs on your foot, um, and, you know, the materials have changed around the structure of a cleat, but we are putting people and athletes into equipment that was, I will not say outdated, but used at a time where the level of explosiveness that we're seeing now was not there. And then you do, on top of that, the the turf is a big issue. I know that thing has been popping up with David and a lot of the uh, players around talking about turf and the issues with turf. I've been on that boat for a very, very long time. Uh, grown up playing soccer myself, that difference between a turf field and a grass field is incredible. Um, so a hamstring injuries, while especially in Green Bay's 
realm is a big deal with Watson. And it sounds like Stokes had some issues with that hamstring and Aaron Jones pops up. In reality, 20% of your roster, 20% of your injured players are going to be hamstring injuries anyway. It just, I don't want to say it so happens to be the fact that it's big names and starters this year. But if you look at the most explosive players on our roster, it's Stokes, it's Christian, it's Aaron Jones. And it just so happens that those also be the players who have those hamstring injuries. You don't see um, guys who are more finesse like Razul, who deal more on the technique side of it, like Devante. You don't really see those guys popping up with hamstring pulls. It's guys who really explode off the line, who put a lot of downward pressure when they're kicking their foot back in mid stride. That's when you see a hamstring injury. Aaron Jones, his run on week one, that is a typical hamstring strain as far as mechanism of injury. Open field, running all out for an elongated amount of time, as much explosive power as a guy like he him can produce, that is super common. Do hamstring injuries recur um i guess within specific guys or is it just a matter of getting unlucky if you if 20 percent of your injuries are going to be in that hamstring muscle is it really just a guy being prone for that kind of injury like i i ask because christian watson has documented has had documented hamstring issues going back to like 2019 even when he was in college is it a you get injured you kind of are going to have that problem for a while or is it just a matter of being unlucky with a common injury it's going to be something that is going to stick around for quite a bit. If Even if you go back to somebody like Clay Matthews, he had tweaked his hamstring in his college days, and he fought it his entire career. So guys like that who rely on their athleticism, their bodies just cannot handle the force that their muscles are producing. And you'll see that those tears and those hamstring strains will be fairly common in specific players it's not so much rare that it pops up one and done with this type of an injury but it's more common and more likely to be something that every couple seasons you'll see i know hate to i hope that for christian's sake that is a one and done situation but i would not be surprised at all if once every two or three years we see him pop up on the injury report for a week or two if not a month of hamstring injuries or hamstring tears, if it's even worse, um, or soreness, if nothing else, just because of the amount of force that he's bigger, stronger, faster, and his body just can't uh, rely on the forces that the muscles are needing to create that speed of somebody like him. I want to be careful with how I ask this next question because I don't want to imply that the Packers aren't doing something that they should be doing, <laughs> but if you were going to work on a way to prevent hamstring injuries, what would you do? Just as a hypothetical, if you were trying to cut down the amount of hamstring injuries, what are the steps you take to try to prevent that kind of injury? A big thing with injury prevention on the, from an athletic trainer perspective um, and physical therapy perspective, we want to work with the athletes putting the, that joint of the knee specifically, but also all the way up into the hip. Cause you gotta remember that hamstring, it actually inserts its point is in your pelvic girdle and runs all the way down before it splits into two different long heads in the back of your, or three actually in the back of your leg there. Um, you wanna use that muscle group and put it through all of the range of motions with increasing capabilities of force. So we don't want an athlete to go out and just start sprinting, obviously. We want to work within the confined environment of using that knee, using that leg, specifically on an injury recovery treatment side of it. You want to allow that muscle group in those joints to get used to being put in uncomfortable positions. Locking your body in a true 90 to 90 degree angles only everything anatomically in a straight line while from a weightlifting perspective is correct. That allows the best force production. 
in a real world setting like athletics, it doesn't correlate very well. So working within even something as common as working within the gym, working within the strength coach and the lifting coaches to create more lateral lunges, to do more, um, they're called sissy squats, where you're up on your toes, bowing backwards, putting pressure with body weight or very limited weight on your joints in abnormal situations will allow for more flexibility, which decreases your likelihood of injury. Um, one of the big things, one of the big trends we're seeing in athletics is doing static stretching before exercise has not been correlated to injury prevention. So a lot of times you'll see these guys will spend 30 or 40 minutes doing yoga type poses before they go and lift heavy. And that does absolutely nothing from an injury perspective side. And from an athletic side, it will not overstretch, but it will decrease the amount, the ability to exercise to their full potential. We want to see more dynamic things. We want to see more bouncing, more plyometrics, more body weight movement in that warmup that puts those joints through abnormal ranges of motion. And that's pretty common with all athletic trainers. Um, like you said, I don't want phrases like, oh, I know more than the ATs over in Green Bay do because absolutely not. Um, that is something fairly common, but it is a new trend within the last, oh shoot, like five years that we've been seeing these very interesting uh, data lines within the research of, you know, not doing 90 degree angles, not doing static stretching, not doing um, typical bench squat, deadlift type movements, using abnormal ranges of motion putting your body through different ranges of stress. Looking at where the Packers kind of have shaken out injury-wise so far this year, maybe the last couple of years, what are your big takeaways as far as, I guess, the state of injuries in Green Bay and where the Packers stand in that respect? Uh, the big one that I've been seeing um, with the injury side, on, side of it is how common these injuries have become throughout the NFL and the way that Green Bay is trending with, we want athletes, we want dudes, we want guys who line up across from the other guy and beat them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, almost going back to those early Rogers days with Mike McCarthy, where it says our guys are better than your guys. Every once in a while, Matt will steam something up that'll actually uh, shake a guy free, but a lot of the things we're seeing now is Christian Watson, you know, six four, four three, you know, just absolute human specimen, or Rashawn Gary, guys like that who are just absolute freaks of the the one percent of the NFL, and that seems to be who Goody's been drafting. The downside is you do see a high injury return on players like that, like Jared, like a uh, Waddle. You see him out every single year or something. Calvin Johnson, they just were talking about him on a couple of documentaries where he, towards the end of his career, couldn't plant his foot and cut left. He had an um, unspoken rule with Matthew Stafford saying, do not throw to me if the route requires me to cut left because I can't plant and cut that way. Just because your body is that big, that strong, that fast, that your muscles will actually destroy themselves and pull themselves and tear themselves because of the force production. So it would not surprise me to see a substantial amount of injuries like we've been seeing and that to maintain throughout Green Bay season while as long as we stick to this trend of, hey, I want the most explosive guy on the board. Well, in theory, that's awesome. But without the training, without the weight room, without the therapy behind it, you're going to see a high, high injury rate on players like that. A big thanks to Luke for joining us on the podcast today. Keep an ear out for him as we look for more answers on big injury questions in the future. 
That's all I've got for you on this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I would appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it. That's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.